This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Chapter 56 One morning, about a week after Bingley's engagement with Jane had been formed, as he and the females of the family were sitting together in the dining-room, their attention was suddenly drawn to the window by the sound of a carriage and they perceived a chaise and four driving up the lawn. It was too early in the morning for visitors, and besides, the equipage did not answer to that of any of their neighbors. The horses were post, and neither the carriage nor the livery of the servant who preceded it were familiar to them. As it was certain, however, that somebody was coming, Bingley instantly prevailed on Miss Bennet to avoid the confinement of such an intrusion, and walk away with him into the shrubbery. They both set off, and the conjectures of the remaining three continued, though with little satisfaction, till the door was thrown open and their visitor entered. It was Lady Catherine de Bourg. They were, of course, all intending to be surprised, but their astonishment was beyond their expectation, and on the part of Miss Bennet and Kitty, though she was perfectly unknown to them, even inferior to what Elizabeth felt. She entered the room with an air more than usually ungracious, made no other reply to Elizabeth's salutation than a slight inclination of the head, and sat down without saying a word. Elizabeth had mentioned her name to her mother on her ladyship's entrance, though no request of introduction had been made. Miss Bennet, all amazement, though flattered by having a guest of such high importance, received her with the utmost politeness. After sitting for a moment in silence, she said very stiffly to Elizabeth, "'I hope you are well, Miss Bennet. That lady, I suppose, is your mother?' Elizabeth replied very concisely that she was. "'And that, I suppose, is one of your sisters?' "'Yes, madame,' said Mrs. Bennet, delighted to speak to a lady, Catherine. "'She is my youngest girl but one. My youngest of all is lately married, and my eldest is somewhere about the grounds.' "'walking with a young man who, I believe, will soon become a part of the family. "'You have a very small park here,' returned Lady Catherine after a short silence. "'It is nothing in comparison of Rosings, my lady, I dare say, "'but I assure you it is much larger than St. William Lucas's. "'This must be the most inconvenient sitting-room for the evening in summer. "'The windows are full west.' "'Mrs. Bennet assured her that they never sat there after dinner, and then added, "'May I take the liberty of asking your ladyship "'whether you left Mr. and Mrs. Collins well?' "'Yes, very well. "'I saw them the night before last.' "'Elizabeth now expected that she would produce a letter for her from Charlotte, "'as it seemed the only probable motive for her calling. "'But no letter appeared, and she was completely puzzled. "'Mrs. Bennet, with great civility, "'begged her ladyship to take some refreshment. "'But Lady Catherine very resolutely and not very politely, declined eating anything, and then, rising up, said to Elizabeth, "'Miss Bennet, there seemed to be a prettyish kind of a little wilderness on one side of your lawn. I should be glad to take a turn in it, if you will favor me with your company.' "'Go, my dear,' cried her mother, "'and show her ladyship about the different walks. I think she will be pleased with the hermitage.' Elizabeth obeyed, and running into her own room for her parasol, attended her noble guest downstairs. As they passed through the hall, Lady Catherine opened the doors into the dining parlour and drawing room, and pronouncing them, after a short survey, to be decent-looking rooms, walked on. Her carriage remained at the door, and Elizabeth saw that her waiting woman was in it. They proceeded in silence along the gravel walk that led to the copse. Elizabeth was determined to make no effort for conversation with a woman who was now more than usually insolent and disagreeable. "'How could I ever think her like her nephew?' said she, as she looked into her face. As soon as they entered the copse, Lady Catherine began in the following manner. "'You can be at no loss, Miss Bennet, to understand the reason of my journey hither.' "'Your own heart, your own conscience, must tell you why I come.' "'Elizabeth looked with unaffected astonishment. 
Indeed, you are mistaken, madame. I have not been able at all to account for the honor of seeing you here. Miss Bennet, replied her ladyship in an angry tone, you ought to know that I am not to be trifled with. But however insincere you may choose to be, you shall not find me so. My character has been ever celebrated for its sincerity and frankness, and in a cause of such moments as this, I shall certainly not depart from it. A report of a most alarming nature reached me two days ago. I was told that not only your sister was on the point of being most advantageously married, but that you, that Miss Elizabeth Bennet, would, in all likelihood, be soon afterwards united to my nephew, my own nephew, Mr. Darcy. Though I know it must be a scandalous falsehood, though I would not injure him so much as to suppose the truth of it possible, I instantly resolved on setting off for this place, that I might make my sentiments known to you. "'If you believed it impossible to be true,' said Elizabeth, colouring with astonishment and disdain, "'I wonder you took the trouble of coming so far. What could your ladyship propose by it?' "'At once to insist upon having such a report universally contradicted.' "'Your coming to Longburn to see me and my family,' said Elizabeth coolly, "'will rather be a confirmation of it, if, indeed, such a report is in existence.' "'If! Do you then pretend to be ignorant of it? "'Has it not been industriously circulated by yourselves? "'Do you not know that such a report is spread abroad?' "'I never heard that it was.' "'And can you likewise declare that there is no foundation for it?' I do not pretend to possess equal frankness with your ladyship. You may ask questions which I shall not choose to answer. This is not to be borne. Miss Bennet, I insist on being satisfied. Has he, has my nephew, made you an offer of marriage? Your ladyship has declared it to be impossible. It ought to be so. It must be so, while he retains the use of his reason. But your arts and allurements may, in a moment of infatuation, have made him forget what he owes to himself and to all his family. You may have drawn him into it. If I have, I shall be the last person to confess it. Miss Bennet, do you know who I am? I have not been accustomed to such language as this. I am almost the nearest relation he has in the world, and am entitled to know all his dearest concerns. But you are not entitled to know mine, nor will such behavior as this ever induce me to be explicit. Let me be rightly understood. This match, to which you have the presumption to aspire, can never take place. No, never. Mr. Darcy is engaged to my daughter. Now what have you to say? Only this, that if he is so, you can have no reason to suppose he will make an offer to me. Lady Catherine hesitated for a moment, and then replied, The engagement between them is of a peculiar kind. From their infancy they have been intended for each other. It was the favorite wish of his mother's, as well of hers. While in their cradles we planned the union, and now, at the moment when the wishes of both sisters would be accomplished in their marriage, to be prevented by a young woman of inferior birth, of no importance to the world, and wholly unallied to the family? Do you pay no regard to the wishes of his friends, to his tacit engagement with Mr. Burr? Have you lost to every feeling of propriety and delicacy? Have you not heard me say that from his earliest hours he was destined for his cousin? Yes, and I have heard it before. But what is that to me? If there is no other objection to my marrying your nephew, I shall certainly not be kept from it by knowing that his mother and aunt wished him to marry Mr. Burr. You both did as much as you could in planning the marriage. Its completion depended on others. If Mr. Darcy is neither by honor nor inclination confined to his cousin, why is he not to make another choice? And if I am that choice, why may I not accept it? Because honor, decorum, prudence, nay, interest, forbid it. Yes, Miss Bennet, interest. For do not expect to be noticed by his family or friends if you willfully act against the inclinations of all. You will be censured, slighted, and despised by everyone connected with him. Your alliance will be a disgrace. 
Your name will never even be mentioned by any of us. These are heavy misfortunes, replied Elizabeth. But the wife of Mr. Darcy must have such extraordinary sources of happiness necessarily attached to her situation, that she could, upon the whole, have no cause to repine. "'Obstinate, headstrong girl, I am ashamed of you. "'Is this your gratitude for my attentions to you last spring? "'Is nothing due to me on that score? "'Let us sit down. "'You are to understand, Miss Bennet, "'that I came here with the determined resolution of carrying my purpose, "'nor will I be dissuaded from it. "'I have not been used to submit to any person's whims. "'I have not been in the habit of brooking disappointment.' "'That will make your ladyship's situation at present more pitiable, "'but it will have no effect on me. "'I will not be interrupted. Hear me in silence. "'My daughter and my nephew are formed for each other. "'They are descended on the maternal side from the same noble line, "'and on the father's from respectable, honourable, and ancient, "'though untitled, families. "'Their fortune on both sides is splendid.' They are destined for each other by the voice of every member of their respective houses. And what is to divide them? The upstart pretensions of a young woman without family, connections, or fortune? Is this to be endured? But it must not, shall not be. If you were sensible of your own good, you would not wish to quit the sphere in which you have been brought up. In marrying your nephew, I should not consider myself as quitting the sphere. He is a gentleman. I am a gentleman's daughter. So far we are equal. True. You are a gentleman's daughter. But who is your mother? Who are your aunts and uncles? Do not imagine me ignorant of their condition. Whatever my connections may be, said Elizabeth, if your nephew does not object to them, they can be nothing to you. Tell me at once for all, are you engaged to him? Though Elizabeth would not, for the mere purpose of obliging Lady Catherine, have answered this question, she could not but say, after a moment's deliberation, I am not. Lady Catherine seemed pleased. And will you promise me never to enter into such an engagement? I will make no promise of the kind. Miss Bennet, I am shocked and astonished. I expect to find a more reasonable young woman. "'But do not deceive yourself into a belief that I will ever recede. "'I shall not go away till you have given me the insurance I require. "'And I certainly never shall give it. "'I am not to be intimidated into anything so wholly unreasonable. "'Your ladyship wants Mr. Darcy to marry your daughter. "'But would my giving you the wished-for promise make their marriage at all more probable? "'Suppose him to be attached to me.' Would my refusing to accept his hand make him wish to bestow it on his cousin? Allow me to say, Lady Catherine, that the arguments with which you have supported this extraordinary application have been as frivolous as the application was ill-judged. You have widely mistaken my character, if you think I can be worked on by such persuasions as these. How far your nephew might approve of your interference in his affairs, I cannot tell. "'but you most certainly have no right to concern yourself in mine. "'I must beg, therefore, to be importuned no farther on the subject. "'Not so hasty, if you please. "'I have by no means done. "'To all the objections I have already urged, "'I have still another to add. "'I am no stranger to the particulars "'of your younger sister's infamous elopement. "'I know it all.' that the young man's marrying her was a patched-up business, at the expense of your father and uncles. And is such a girl to be my nephew's sister? Is her husband, the son of his late father's steward, to be his brother? Heaven and earth! Of what are you thinking? Are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted? You can now have nothing further to say. She resentfully answered, You have insulted me in every possible method. I must beg to return to the house. And she rose as she spoke. Lady Catherine rose also, and they turned back. Her ladyship was highly incensed. Have you no regard, then, for the honour and credit of my nephew? Unfeeling, selfish girl! 
Do you not consider that a connection with you must disgrace him in the eyes of everybody? Lady Catherine, I have nothing further to say. You know my sentiments. You are then resolved to have him? I have said no such thing. I am only resolved to act in that manner which will, in my own opinion, constitute my happiness, without reference to you or to any person so wholly unconnected with me. It is well. You refuse, then, to oblige me. You refuse to obey the claims of duty, honor, and gratitude. You are determined to ruin him in the opinion of all his friends, and make him the contempt of the world. Neither duty, nor honor, nor gratitude, replied Elizabeth, have any possible claim on me in the present instance. No principle of either would be violated by my marriage with Mr. Darcy. And with regard to the resentment of his family, or the indignation of the world, if the former were excited by his marrying me, it would not give me one moment's concern, and the world in general would have too much sense to join in the scorn. And this is your real opinion? This is your final resolve? Very well. I shall now know how to act. Do not imagine, Miss Bennet, that your ambition will ever be gratified. I came to try you. I hoped to find you reasonable. But, depend on it, I will carry my point. In this manner Lady Catherine talked on, till they were at the door of the carriage, when, turning hastily round, she added, "'I shall take no leave of you, Miss Bennet. I send no compliments to your mother. You deserve no such attention. I am most seriously displeased.' Elizabeth made no answer, and without attempting to persuade her ladyship to return into the house, walked quietly into it herself. She heard the carriage drive away, as she proceeded upstairs. Her mother impatiently met her at the door of the dressing-room, to ask why Lady Catherine would not come in again and rest herself. "'She did not choose it,' said her daughter. "'She would go. "'She is a very fine-looking woman, and her calling here was prodigiously civil. "'For she only came, I suppose, to tell us the Collinses were well. "'She is on her road somewhere, I dare say, and so, passing through Meryton, thought she might as well call on you.' I suppose she had nothing particular to say to you, Lizzie? Elizabeth was forced to give into a little falsehood here, for to acknowledge the substance of their conversation was impossible. End of chapter 56 Chapter 57 The discomposure of spirits which this extraordinary visit threw Elizabeth into could not be easily overcome. Nor could she, for many hours, learn to think of it less than incessantly. Lady Catherine, it appeared, had actually taken the trouble of this journey from Rosings for the sole purpose of breaking off her supposed engagement with Mr. Darcy. It was a rational scheme, to be sure, for from what the reports of their engagement could originate, Elizabeth was at a loss to imagine, till she recollected that, his being the intimate friend of Bingley, and her being the sister of Jane, was enough, at a time when the expectation of one wedding made everybody eager for another, to supply the idea. She had not herself forgotten to feel that the marriage of her sister must bring them more frequently together. And her neighbors at Lucas Lodge, therefore, for through their communication with the Collinses, the report, she concluded, had reached Catherine, had only set that down as almost certain and immediate, which she had looked forward to as possible at some future time. In revolving Lady Catherine's expressions, however, she could not help feeling some uneasiness as to the possible consequence of her persisting in this interference. From what she had said of her resolution to prevent their marriage, it occurred to Elizabeth that she must mediate an application to her nephew, and how he might take a similar representation of the evils attached to a connection with her, she dared not pronounce. She knew not the exact degree of his affection for his aunt, or his dependence on her judgment, but it was natural to suppose that he had thought much higher of her ladyship than she could do, and it was certain that, in enumerating the miseries of a marriage with one whose immediate connections were so unequal with his own, 
his aunt would address him on his weakest side. With his notions of dignity, he would probably feel that the arguments, which to Elizabeth had appeared weak and ridiculous, contained much good sense and solid reasoning. If he had been wavering before as to what he should do, which had often seemed likely, the advice and entreaty of so near a relation might settle every doubt, and determine him at once to be as happy as dignity could unblemished could make him. In that case, he would return no more. Lady Catherine might see him in her way through town, and his engagement to Bingley of coming against to Netherfield must give way. If, therefore, an excuse for not keeping his promise should come to his friend within a few days, she added, I shall know how to understand it. I shall then give over every expectation, every wish of his constancy. If he is satisfied with only regretting me, when he might have obtained my affections in hand, I shall soon cease to regret him at all. The surprise of the rest of the family, on hearing who the visitor had been, was very great. But they obligingly satisfied him, with the same kind of supposition which had appeased Miss Bennet's curiosity, and spared Elizabeth from much teasing on the subject. The next morning, as she was going downstairs, she was met by her father, who came out of his library with a letter in his hand. "'Lizzie,' said he, "'I was going to look for you. Come into my room.' She followed him thither, and her curiosity to know what he had to tell her was heightened by the supposition of its being in some manner connected with the letter he held. It suddenly struck her that it might be from Lady Catherine and she anticipated with dismay all the consequent explanations. She followed her father to the fireplace, and they both sat down. He then said, I have received a letter this morning that has astonished me exceedingly. As it principally concerns yourself, you ought to know its contents. I did not know before that I had two daughters on the brink of matrimony. Let me congratulate you on a very important conquest. The color now rushed into Elizabeth's cheeks, in the instantaneous conviction of its being a letter from the nephew, instead of the aunt, and she was undetermined whether most to be pleased that he explained himself at all, or offended that his letter was not rather to address to herself, when her father continued. "'You look conscious. Young ladies have a great penetration in such matters as these, but I think I may defy even your sagacity to discover the name of your admirer.' This letter is from Mr. Collins. From Mr. Collins? And what can he have to say? Something very much to the purpose, of course. He begins with congratulations on the approaching nuptials of my eldest daughter, of which, it seems, he has been told by some of the good-natured gossiping Lucases. I shall not sport with your impatience by reading what he says on that point. What relates to yourself is as follows. Having thus offered you the sincerest congratulations of Mrs. Collins and myself on this happy event, let me now add a short hint on the subject of another, of which we have been advised by the same authority. Your daughter Elizabeth, it is presumed, will not long bear the name of Bennet, after her elder sister has resigned it, and the chosen partner of her fate may be reasonably looked up to as one of the most illustrious personages in the land." "'Can you possibly guess, Lizzie, who is meant by this? "'This young gentleman is blessed, in a peculiar way, "'with everything the heart of a mortal can most desire. "'Splendid property, noble kindred, and extensive patronage. "'Yet, in spite of all these temptations, "'let me warn my cousin Elizabeth, and yourself, "'of what evils you may incur "'by a precipitate closure with this gentleman's proposal, "'which, of course, you will be inclined to take immediate advantage of. "'Have you any idea, Lizzie, who this gentleman is? "'But now it comes out. "'My motive for cautioning you is as follows. "'We have reason to imagine that his aunt, Lady Catherine de Bourg, "'does not look on the match with a friendly eye. "'Mr. Darcy, you see, is the man. "'Now, Lizzie, I think I have surprised you. "'Could he or the Lucases have pitched on any man within the circle of our acquaintance "'whose name would have given the lie more effectively to what they related?' 
Mr. Darcy, who never looks at a woman but to see a blemish, and who probably never looked at you in his life? It is admirable. Elizabeth tried to join her father's pleasantry, but could only force one most reluctant smile. Never had his wit been directed in a manner so little agreeable to her. Are you not diverted? Are you not diverted? Oh, yes. Pray read on. After mentioning the likelihood of this marriage to her ladyship last night, she immediately, with her usual condescension, expressed what she felt on the occasion. When it became apparent that in the score of some family objections on the part of my cousin, she would never give her consent to what she termed so disgraceful a match. I thought it my duty to give the speediest intelligence of this to my cousin, that she and her noble admirer may be aware of what they are about, and not run hastily into a marriage that has not been properly sanctioned. Mr. Collins, moreover, adds, I am truly rejoiced that my cousin Lydia's sad business has been so well hushed up, and am only concerned that their living together before marriage took place should be so generally known. I must not, however, neglect the duties of my station, or refrain from declaring my amazement at hearing that she received the young couple into your house as soon as they were married. It was an encouragement of vice. And had I been the rector of Longbourn, I should very strenuously have opposed it. You ought certainly to forgive them, as a Christian, but never admit them into your sight, or allow their names to be mentioned in your hearing. That is his notion of Christian forgiveness? The rest of his letter is only about his dear Charlotte's situation, and his expectation of a young olive branch. But, Lizzie, you did not look as if you enjoyed it. You are not going to be missish, I hope, and pretend to be affronted at an idle report. For what do we live but to make sport for our neighbors, and to laugh at them in our own turn? Oh, cried Elizabeth, I am excessively diverted. But it is so strange. Yes, that is what makes it amusing. Had they fixed on any other man, it would have been nothing. But his perfect indifference, and your pointed dislike, make it so delightfully absurd. Much as I abominate writing, I would not give up Mr. Collins's correspondence for any consideration. Nay, when I read a letter of his, I cannot help giving him the preference, even over Wickham, as much as I value the impudence and hypocrisy of my son-in-law. And pray, Lizzie, what said Lady Catherine about this report? Did she call to refuse her consent? To this question his daughter replied only with a laugh and as it had been asked without the least suspicion, she was not distressed by his repeating it. Elizabeth had never been more at a loss to make her feelings appear what they were not. It was necessary to laugh, when she would rather have cried. Her father had most cruelly mortified her, by what he said of Mr. Darcy's indifference, and she could do nothing but perhaps wonder, at such a want of penetration, or a fear that perhaps, instead of his seeing too little, she might have fancied too much. End of chapter 57 Recorded by Susan Hooks, Tokyo, Japan